Hello, I'm Eva Schoenfeld. I'm one of the three hosts of Coming Down to Earth, uh, and an, online exp- uh, an online summit exploring pathways towards healthy and regenerative ways of being uh, and the potential for transformation within the conflicts that we experience. I'm speaking to Tarek Masarani today. Hello, Tarek. Welcome. Thank you very much for you. being willing to, to speak. Um, and I wonder if you could start by giving us just a little potted bio of, of you know, who you are, what the kind of work that you get up to and that kind of thing. Yeah, gladly. Um, hello, everyone. I'll, I'll begin by saying that I'm speaking to you uh, from uh, a place in southern Utah. It's a small town called Hurricane. Uh, I've been spending some time and it is on traditional Paiute lands and um, it's also home to uh, quite an impressive array of mountains, uh, lots of reptiles, very playful birds these days, uh, and then farm animals just across the street, for example, are cows right next to the elementary school playground. Um, it's an interesting place to be uh, during this time. Uh, uh, it's uh, much different from the busyness of Washington, D.C., where I usually have my base. Um, but since the pandemic outbreak, I've found myself uh, closer to family, with family, in the Northwest. Um, so I think D.C. is an important piece of who I am. It's where I've lived for almost 20 years now, closing in on 20 years. Um, uh, It's a place I initially went to for law school. Um, um, I stuck with DC, but I ditched the the law work (laughs) quite some time ago. Um, My life originated uh, in in East Germany uh, when it was still a communist country. And uh, I was I was born to a Lebanese mother and a, and a German, East German father who were both in medical school at the time. Mm. Uh, I moved when I was about seven to the United States and have been living largely in the U.S. Uh, with a good deal of travel, uh, and some extended stays and lots of work outside of the U.S., particularly in, on the African continent, um, in the Middle East, um, and to a much lesser extent in Europe and South Asia. Um, I mentioned law school and legal work. I did, I did work as an attorney around poverty law, public interest law, and human rights for a couple of years, or five years. Um, and then myself found a transition uh, that took place over the span of a few years to doing work that was more grounded in collaboration and uh, that spoke more, more to my, both my skills and my passions um, for working together uh, and looking at, at some of the root causes of the problems uh, that we faced. So that has involved everything from dialogue related work, um, activism, uh, restorative justice, um, and a lot of time thinking up different projects and figuring out how to make them possible um, from a funding perspective, from a design perspective, from a a stakeholder engagement perspective. Um, Spend a lot of time uh, facilitating either more traditional training workshops or alternative group processing to deal with conflict, with harm, with complex decision-making, with building community, with grieving, with celebrating. Um, and uh, I'll say lastly that I've had the privilege um, and satisfaction of figuring out to, to, to a good extent how to take my life uh, off of the, the money exchange economy. So over the last five years or so, uh, I've managed to do most of my work uh, as a gift, um, 
which allows uh, allows for me to work with a lot of grassroots groups and unfunded uh, campaigns or causes, um, and have been the beneficiary of um, housing and food and other support that, that people have provided for me on a similar gift basis. Hmm. And all of that has meant that I've, I've gotten to think less about what do I need to do to get by and to support my family and to find a place to live. And more and more my work has been geared or inspired really by a lot of reflection on what is the impact, the most impact I can do given the various forms of privilege and the capacities um, that I can offer. Hmm. Wow, that's quite an achievement. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Um, Tarek, I just want to check whether you can maybe give your computer a little sugar or something because there's a kind of hissing when you speak that wasn't there before. Hmm. Okay. Let me try. Let's see. Is this sounding any different? I, I just muted and unmuted. I can shake. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's it was is it because you're slightly louder. You're you're louder than the. the it kind of sounds like someone's switching sand around. Wow. Uh, and it wasn't there before, so. But it actually, it it made you with the sugar. Maybe it's gone. I don't know. Say something. Yeah. Well, how does this sound? Yeah, no, that's much better. That is. <laughs> okay, I'll get Nuno to knock this bit out. Hopefully. <laughs> um. All right, so I definitely need to take notes from you on, on how to live um, within a, a kind of gift economy. That sounds, that sounds fantastic. Um, but that's not what we're here to talk about, um, which was much more the kind of breadth of experience that you have with um, techniques and interventions and, and systems and formats that can support um, kind of less uh, less fraught communication and, and uh, ability to be with people and also maybe kind of help deal with it when it gets fraught and, and conflictual. Um, and you were going to talk a bit, I think, to begin with about your journey with NVC, which is like a really core point of reference for you. Yeah. Yeah, so I... Uh... I will say I grew up uh, largely in an Arab family, uh, with the Arab side of my family. Um, I remember from very early on that there was something about the, the way that my family communicated um, that didn't sit right. Uh, I'll add that my family, not only are they, are they from Lebanon, uh, but they are also um, upper class, uh, formally educated lawyers and, and doctors, and to some extent political leaders. And um, what I didn't have words for back then was that my family system very much was embedded in a culture of, of um, minimizing emotional, con emotional uh, awareness, self awareness, um, seeking, uh, seeking to argue through life and to analyze and judge and blame. Uh, and I, uh, I think that's what I really struggled with. And I, and, uh, and I remember as a young person already that this was, this, this was, there's something missing and there was something, um, or destructive even about it. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think I was prompted already from a young age to, 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 to like look at that and, and, and in some ways resist or rebel against that in, in my own ways, but obviously I'd also internalized a lot of that as well. 
um, that came out more than ever, that internalized um, judgmental voice, argumentative voice, very over cognating and not, not connecting to the underlying feelings. Um, when I had been uh, five years with a romantic partner and we were getting ready to have children. Um, uh, something about the pressure, something about the anticipation of children, um, something about living together, the money situation. Uh, yeah, it, it brought out, it, it, it created situations, conversations that, that were fraught, as you said, that were fraught with, uh, with tension and brought out communication that I was, that I, I had thought I left behind me. Mm. Um, it was in the context of this that I had a, f I wouldn't even say he was a friend at the time. I had someone who I, who I'd met maybe once or twice before, who had a knack for going straight to the heart of, of things. Um, who had asked me at some point within, within the first 30 seconds of a conversation, well, how are you? Um, what's going on in your life? And uh, generally being a, quite a transparent person, I said, well, you know, uh, I'm, pretty, I'm struggling in ways that surprise me. And um, by the end of the conversation, he had offered and I had accepted uh, for him to be a support person in a mm -hmm. conversation with my partner. Uh, unfortunately, she was willing as well. And that conversation <laughs> was so different from any conversation we'd had that was, you know, conversation about the hard stuff, um, our relationship, having children, the things that were, were, were the complaints and grievances that had built up over time. And I, and, and I remember I was so surprised in part because all I knew about him really was that he was a physicist and I had studied physics and my association with physics was generally like, these are really rational people. <laughs> and I associated rational people more or less with my family of doctors and those. So it blew me out of water that, that this physicist was able to change the whole tenor of the conversation by asking certain questions and reflecting back certain aspects of what we were saying that weren't even, uh, explicit if, if even like conscious so we were even conscious of so I remember at the end of the conversation walking out to the outside with him leading going outside and and saying you know um, what what is what what is it that you just did with us <laughs> and he handed me um, he handed me Marshall Rosenberg's book the language of life um, and he said well check this out um, and, and this, is, this is some of what I've, I've been learning from. Mm. Yeah, that was my first introduction to NVC, nonviolent communication. Um, I wanna note that uh, that individual is Ryan McAllister, who's alive and well, and we're dear friends. We, we ended up living together for a good eight years in an intentional community that we co-founded, which is very much based on NVC, and I credit it for uh, most of the skill I have between living there and being a parent. I think those were the two most intense uh, training grounds for dealing with conflict <laughs> and more than anything for dealing with myself. Um, I always like to say children have helped me raise myself in ways I wouldn't have had otherwise had the opportunity to. Um, and I'll also add that Ryan, um, uh, while still active in NBC, uh, then and now um, has incorporated much more than just nonviolent communication. Uh, I know at that time, reevaluation re counseling, co-counseling was a big part of uh, his, uh, the sources he drew from. Uh, and in a similar way, I also want to note that I've, I've come across uh, other ideas um, or had other ideas reinforced um, that are not within the NBC framework that I think have been very helpful. And one of the things I've enjoyed doing is trying to find ways to bring them together. Um, uh, and I think we may talk a little bit more about the, the holes I see in nonviolent communication and how those can be filled. Um, but I'll say that uh, NBC, I am 
uh, grateful for what it has brought me. Um, I, as I mentioned, I, I did practice law for a number of years, and um, I had this knack, which a number of my colleagues and supervisors noted, of actually being able to void uh, time in court um, and being able to settle um, uh, the, the various cases that I had quite quickly and, and also being able to connect very intimately with, uh, with clients. Um, mm. And uh, I, I credit a lot of that to the very intentional training that I was seeking um, through, through nonviolent communication. Um, so it helped me as an attorney. And I, I remember in yeah. later years offering NVC workshops to lawyers and how clear it made to me how much there was an unlearning that needed to happen from the way that I had been trained in law school, in the practice of law, and by the, the lawyers in my family. Um, a training to, to really step back and uh, suspend suspend what we think and want out of a conversation to really be present mm. to the other people. Mm. That's fascinating. Yeah, I guess, yeah, it feels like a completely different mindset. Um, although I guess, you know, well, it feels like the, I mean, it, it, Presumably, it, it, it depends on the kind of field of law, but it feels like a lot of what law is seeking to do is to kind of control, to, to um, you know, to find out who's right and who's wrong and then, you know, impose sanction or, or whatever it is. That's, that's <laughs> probably a very simplistic view. Well, um, I'll, I'll tell a story. Um, I was working on... Um, I was a junior attorney working on a very large team, mostly of volunteer pro bono or nonprofit lawyers. I think we had 15, 20 uh, attorneys on our team. Um, and it included Earth Rights International Center for Constitutional Reform, or Center for Constitutional Rights. Um, I remember Noam Chomsky's sister, uh, the United attorney was on that team. And we were, it was the case against Shell for uh, the, and the, subsidi the Shell subsidiary in Nigeria um, for its complicity in the uh, killing of the Ogoni Nine, which were nine activists uh, who were part of the Mosop movement in the 90s, uh, resisting Shell and the central government, the military government at the time's uh, activities that were desecrating the environment and causing pollution and other health issues for the local communities. Mm. And um, I, uh, as, as, a, as a young attorney at the time, a fellow, a human rights fellow to actually a law firm, um, I was given various research-related tasks and, you know, and then also to write some of these briefs. Um, we were in the Federal District Court of New York, and the court had been assigned to the Southern District, um, and it was decided that that wasn't a great venue for a variety of reasons, including that the judge there wasn't as sympathetic as in another district. Um, I was asked to write um, a brief uh, uh, that argues why this wasn't a, a, a good venue for the case. Mm -hmm. So I go into the law and I'm going, and, and I'm, you know, I'm like, I'm not finding that many convincing reasons uh, to, um, to change venue. Um, but I come up with some, and I think I write a three-page memo or brief, draft brief. Now, my supervisor, who is an incredible attorney, <laughs> I mean, uh, I, to this day, I, I'm just in awe as a human rights attorney, mm. he slams me, lots of red lines, red marks on my, on my paper, and, and three days later, sa you know, sends me, says, this is what I was looking for. And I read this paper. And the paper is able to come up with arguments I didn't even think were possible. So convincing <laughs> that at the end of it, I was just like, wow. <laughs> and it, it was a telling, I mean, this is a, this is a, a cliche of attorneys, 
but this is how I experienced that cliche in the, in the most clearest way. It was telling that um, I really struggled to be able to put aside um, the bigger picture, mm -hmm. the, the arguments, concerns of the other parties, of the court, and to focus in on just those pieces, both of fact and of legal theory, that would support one very simple outcome. Mm -hmm. um, that there's a, there's a process there of both simplifying mm -hmm. in terms of what you're considering and then complexifying in terms of language and citation in what you're, in where you've you know, honed in on. Uh, and it wasn't, it didn't take long after that before I left law. <laughs> I say it's kind of the inverse really of of seeing the kind of the complexity and trying to say you know to draw out the simple truth within that it's like, right. it's like the reverse yeah um so you mentioned that you know for all its strengths and um you know all the gifts that it brings uh, nvc has got some kind of tricky edges uh where you know that it's it it doesn't deliver so well or, um, you know, where it needs to, it needs to be growing and changing. But could yeah. you talk about that? You know, maybe before I get to that, I want to mention, because I mentioned NVC in the context of legal practice. I want to mention, that, um, I, as I meant, I, I, I'd lived in a, an intentional community for eight years. And it's both where I learned NVC and where I thought it was um, exceedingly helpful um, to, to working through uh, life in a, in a, in a con consensus-based community. Um, I also say parenting, um, it, it shaped the way I even approached parenting um, and what I saw parenting meant. Um, and, <clears throat> and then I like to believe that it's really seeped into everything I do and, and the way I engage with the world. And sometimes uh, that's very clear, um, certainly in work, things where I deal with very overt conflict, um, but also in, in the more hidden moments of life uh, when having a difficult conversation with partners or family. Um, yeah, when facing news like we have surrounding us these days and how do I, how do, you know, how do I process that? on my own, whether there's anyone around. Um, so in a way, it's helped me develop ways to process life as I experience it, um, that give me more creativity and choice um, on how to move forward. Um, and I think that's one thing to understand. Uh, NBC is often presented as a set of steps for communication. Um, I, see it, I see it as that, but I see the more powerful aspect to me has been that it's an, an internal orientation, an internal mm -hmm. lens um, that, uh, that provides a lot more clarity about what to make of the world around us and how to be in, it, in alignment with the inner and the outer. Mm -hmm. So now with that said, um, a, I definitely had a period in my life um, where I... I thought this is it. <laughs> this is like the answer to everything. <laughs> uh, having empathic connection with oneself and with someone else, with, with the, the, the world outside is really what was needed. Um, and, <clears throat> and I think those are, are, those are critical. Um, what I've come to grow into is seeing that uh, NVC um, misses certain important pieces and, and, and I've tried to puzzle those into a, a larger, more unifying framework uh, for myself. Mm. Um, so uh, some of those, um, to begin with, there is a way that NVC presents a binary around certain concepts. Um, uh, and as 
as with most binaries, uh, that actually suppresses, uh, I think, the, the complexity or understanding nuance of things. Mm -hmm. To give you an example, um, there's often times uh, needs in NBC, and this is for folks who have an understanding of NBC, will be, will be uh, distinguished uh, from strategies. Right? Mm -hmm. um, something that Ryan and I, uh, in the trainings we do together, have developed is to put them onto a spectrum. Um, that uh, we, we can see ourselves orienting in the way we talk and approach something as more conscious of the needs or as more focused on the strategies. And putting that on the spectrum both allows us to see, uh, you know, there's some use to the, the idea of strategies and so it allows us to kind of modulate where we want to be. Um, and it allows our, 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 our language um, to sound less clunky sound less uh, unfamiliar. Um, right. That's just one example. There are a number of binaries that NVC presents. Um, like many models, they create categories and binary, uh, binaries um, that I think are ultimately helpful for learning, but then actually keep, they, they just sort of stop growth at some point. So um, nonviolent communication places a big value on taking responsibility for one's own emotions. Uh, so it's a very common quib in, in NBC to avoid saying you make me feel this way and rather to say uh, I feel this way when you do this or that or when I see or hear you say or do this or that. Um, I think again that's a very powerful idea especially if you're caught into the habitual thinking that, ev that your feelings are kind of a hostage to the world around you. Mm. Um, and again, we're, it's sort of you get trapped in this binary of thinking, well, it's either all of the world uh, that is making me feel, or I'm actually the only one responsible for emotions. And again, that's, it's more subtle than that. And, and I don't think NBC has done enough to really under integrate an understanding of the nervous system and the way that even words um, can act on our unconscious, uh, uh, autonomous, autonomous nervous system to create experience in us, in us that we may be able to regulate after the fact, mm. but depending on the degree of uh, activation of our nervous system, depending on trauma that might reside in the, in the nervous system, um, it's not as easy as saying we can take responsibility and control our own mm. emotions. So that subtlety is lost in, in, the, in the simple uh, traditional NBC approach. Um, similarly, NBC ce celebrates that everyone has choice um, and you know, cannot control other people's actions. And I think implicit in that is uh, a, a minimizing of the, the structural constraints within which, within which people operate. Mm. Um, I fear that taking that belief in responsibility for one's choices, for one's act actions, to the extreme, while again, I think very helpful if one doesn't have a, have a habit of taking any responsibility or choice, mm. but taken to the extreme, um, I believe that leads to a, a lack of awareness about uh, systems of power and privilege, and how, the, how that affects um, people and their actions mm -hmm. and their choices. Um, that, that is compounded by the fact that NBC makes a distinction between interpretations and observations, and things like power and privilege um, uh, have an interpretational layer to them. Mm -hmm. And NBC kind of favors expressing oneself in into forms of observations, and it's very difficult to make observations that really capture what systems of power are, mm. right? just in terms of observations. Yeah, yeah. Much of what we know about systems is through patterns that we haven't directly observed, but that have been described, that have been formulated, that have been brought together um, uh, from, uh, from the stories, 
the histories, the narratives, the personal experiences, firsthand, secondhand, thirdhand, of, of many people in a society. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it would be very difficult to really capture those if you were asked just to describe your own observations. Um, yeah, because yeah. they're, they're, you know, they're, the, the observation bit is, is right just there in the moment. Whereas, you know, what you're saying about all the structure is that it's, you know, this kind of massive context for that, that in that one moment, it, yeah, it's, it's hard, it's hard, impossible to capture in, in words. Um, and yet it's still there in the room uh, in all kinds of different ways. Well, wow, yeah, that's really, really good way of putting it. Mm. Yeah. So it's, it's realizations like this that I've had over time that have led me to want to um, adapt, kind of develop on uh, the, the existing MDC framework. And I'm certainly not alone in this. Um, I've been inspired a lot by the work of Nikki Kashtan um, and an increasing number of MDC practitioners and what I like to call like the new generation of MDC, who really um, grappling with how to make MDC more um, embracing of notions of power and privilege and how to make the NBC community more embracing of not just those ideas but also the, the people of color within the NBC communities mm -hmm. um, um, and that is a, that is an ongoing struggle um, and, an, and an important one so <clears throat> um, I think the the piece that has concerned me most around that is that um, to the extent that NBC um, provides this very useful, coherent language, but that that language does not cover power and privilege. It doesn't, that language in of itself does not necessarily raise awareness of power and privilege. Although I will say Marshall Rosenberg, from everything I've heard from some of his closest colleagues and friends mm -hmm. um, found thought social justice was at the center of everything, of all of it. Um, and that he said any system that doesn't address fundamental social questions of equity was not one worth having. Mm -hmm. um, so it's an, you know, it's interesting to find ourselves in a place where that, that kind of centrality of a larger systemic lens was lost somewhere along the way and now is being picked up again. Yeah. Um, but what concerns me is actually that having, a, having a, a language and a tool that is so powerful, but that doesn't, hasn't yet fully integrated uh, a, a power and privilege lens actually can just end up doing more harm. Right? Yes. In, it, it can end up um, how it can end up leading people like myself to kind of see like the answer is just to make empathic connection and focus less on the systemic structural changes that are needed. It can mean in an interpersonal con conversation that someone experienced in practice in NBC says, well, you know, that's just an interpretation that I'm biased. What, what are your observations and what are your underlying needs? And that kind of, uh, that kind of language can have the very damaging effect of minimizing, justifying um, to someone who had a real felt experience, um, that they're not able to put into this language um, that they may not have been trained in, that they may not have find resonance in, um, affinity to. Um, and this is particularly concerning because most folks who gravitate towards NVC and who put life, their, uh, their energies into it, uh, come from dominant identity groups. Um, and uh, there's a real danger that NVC provides another rung on the, the kind of implicit ladder of superiority that people can place themselves onto. Mm. So those are some of the critiques I have. Um, there, are, there are more nuanced to them and there, there are more that are out there, but, uh, those are those are some of the the ones I find most important to name. Yeah, 
Yeah, it's it's uh, yeah, extraordinarily kind of potent um, little corner there with you know such a lot of um, insight and benefit that it has to offer, but with such a lot of um, yeah complexity to that and uh, and potential pitfalls. Uh, uh, yeah, I think you put that really really well. It, it sounds that you do you do quite a lot of this kind of um, innovating and hybridizing and, and, and putting together different ideas. And you were telling me about the kind of um, synergy of two frameworks that you're bringing together that have, has particular um, relevance and interest for uh, activists around nonviolent action and, and peace building. Can you speak a bit about that? Yeah. Um, you know, one of... Dr. Martin Luther King's most um, off-sided works is the letter from the Birmingham jail. Um, and in it, Dr. King is actually speaking to the community of religious leaders, um, mm. particularly in the, in the black community, um, who disagree with his incitement, as they say, um, who see that he's uh, shaking the cart, rocking the boat. And he, and he speaks to them in such eloquent words um, in this very long letter about the fact that um, you cannot have just dialogue alone. Um, you know, to refer to another oft-cited phrase, you need both love and power. And what Dr. King describes in that letter, which echoes what, what, what Gandhi has written and spoken to, is a notion that has that sometimes, and in my experience, often been lost amongst those seeking social change, which is that there needs to be a synergy of both power and love. Mm -hmm. um, that on its own, um, extending a hand to dialogue, um, you know, seeking to have empathy empathic connection through nonviolent communication, the tools of nonviolent communication. On its own, that's not enough. And, and similarly, on its own, the fighting for change through marches, through protests, um, through boycotts, through sanctions, uh, building giant coalitions to show numbers, all of these are aspects of, of, of raising power, shifting power, um, that on its own, that is not enough either. Um, that all along the way, in a very fluid way, anyone in any movement in any group that wants to make a change needs to figure out how to integrate those. Now, it might be that you have some people within a movement, some people within a group that are going to be the ones who focus more on the dialogue, or the ones who focus more on the nonviolent action. But somehow, whether it's the same people or different people within a group, it needs to be coordinated. Yeah. And if you look at any of the successful, and there are many nonviolent campaigns for social change, um, they involved both with great courage and great love. So this is not a new idea. Um, uh, and yet uh, I, I wanna just lift up the US Institute of Peace has taken um, in particular Lisa Shirk and Nadine Block who authored the, the, the sort of defining manual on the synergy of nonviolent action and peace building 
they've done a lot, I think, to bring this back um, and to articulate it uh, very clearly, this particular framework. And I've, I've been privileged to, to work with USIP for many years and including to, to, to train on this particular synergizing on bound action and peace building framework which <clears throat> in the simplest terms just seeks to break down the walls between these two aspects of social change. Mm. And there, there are language walls, right? There are ways that nonviolent act activists and peace builders speak differently, mm. miss each other, even though they're talking about the same thing, right? So one might talk about uh, dialogue, conflict, transformation, the other might talk about social justice and liberation and anti-oppression. Mm. Um, certainly language might also suggest that they have different focuses and they do. Although I think there's the deepest focus where there's a lot of unity between the two approaches. There are often different people doing this who kind of favor or accentuate um, different skill sets as being more important. Um, and so this idea is to like merge the language, the skill sets, um, the realization of shared goals um, in a way where you can be a peace builder and a nonviolent activist. Um, and that doesn't seem a like a contradiction. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so this, is, this is a framework I'm quite excited about, uh, something I've been bringing into uh, local activist communities in, in DC, um, as well as like, uh, um, uh, peace activists that, that in Afghanistan, where I was able to visit for two weeks uh, in, uh, in February. Um, and uh, I'll say the, the inspiration for me is that we can continue to look at the way we're mobilizing. And that is a big thing happening right now uh, in the world. Speaking now in the June, July, summer 2020 timeframe. Um, uh, speaking of ways to mobilize um, that both allow for a group to create more power, which is gonna need internal dialogue. It's gonna need a lot of empathy. Otherwise these groups will break down mm. before they even uh, come close to fighting the big fight. <laughs> they may break down internally because they don't have enough of the peace building, traditionally considered peace building skills mm. to organize, to understand, to get through their own differences. Not to mention to use those skills to bring in larger coalitions, which is what's necessary to continue to bring, to build more power. Mm -hmm. And so here I wanna offer, there's the idea of power with in the peace building community, that you have shared power. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you're using power with to power up, meaning to create a base of more power. And once you have more power as a coalition, as a movement, then you may have the chance to exercise power with, with the more powerful, those who are making decisions, mm. right? But before you have more of a balanced power with the, power, the, the decision making, makers, peace builders will not be able to enact systemic change, right? So, so using these tools of both of the peace building communities and the nonviolent action communities to, to increase a, a kind of like a complementary, a synergy, a harmony, a concert of power with and power uh, up uh, mm -hmm. for, for larger social transformation. That's fascinating. And, and so do, can you give me kind of like practical examples of, of how groups might operate differently once they've taken on this kind of idea of, yeah, you can have both and, you don't have to have just one or the other. What, what, what does it look like? Yeah, so I think um, for social justice groups, um, those who identify as, you know, 
uh, as a calling for so to, to social justice, um, one of the most practical things is to spend time developing your internal um, skills and orientations mm. towards conflict transformation and peace building. Mm. Right? Your own culture of working together, having empathy, um, seeing conflict as generative or responding to conflict in ways that are generative, um, developing agreements for how to communicate, engage with conflict, no matter how uh, uncomfortable it may be, commitments to doing these things. Mm. These are all things that peace builders uh, uh, are fairly good at. Not necessarily within their own groups, though. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, I certainly have, have also seen peace building groups who also fall short on applying their own tools and frameworks internally mm. to create robust shared power organizations. Um, so for social justice groups, that is, you know, that is essential mm. to be able to, to do that internally and then to do that with your most immediate allies and stakeholders. Mm. Um, and then ultimately to expand that envelope to include those who may not necessarily be allies, who may be, have seen as, as enemies. Mm. Um, but knowing that after you've marched, you know, I, I, I remember, I remember even at the peak of the salt march, Mohandas Gandhi was writing the British authorities saying, um, I still extend a hand of dialogue. Mm. You know, here, here is Gandhi um, in some ways at the height of power, mm. of the, the independence, the self-determination um, the movement in India, the decolonization movement. Um, saying, I still am ready to dialogue and to work together. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so so that, that is for social justice groups. For, for peace building groups, mm. I think it's uh, the important thing there is to understand how power operates. And so to know what are the limitations of peace building tools um, for, for really being able to uh, address the uh, the root causes, the enabling conditions, mm. um, the structural foundations for what peace builders often see and focus on is the symptoms of the problem. Yes. Um, Not so much the analysis. Yeah. The visible manifestations of a conflict that is actually rooted in structures. Yeah. not necessarily in individual individuals or particular social groups. Mm. They're rooted in... What, what you were saying about, uh, within the, with the MDC. Yeah. yeah. So, so, you know, having an awareness of how those structures um, uh, play themselves out to drive conflict and recognizing that to change those structures requires, goes beyond peace building tools, mm. you know, really takes tools of nonviolent action and sometimes violent action. Uh, what I mean to say is that I believe nonviolent uh, is both as a matter of principle and uh, practicality is more effective or is more desirable. And yet I have, a, I have a great deal of understanding and sympathy for those who do choose violence. Uh, as, as, a, as the only strategy they can imagine uh, to address you know, structural violence that they've been subject to yeah. uh, throughout history. So I think there's, there's that kind of understanding, um, uh, that kind of awareness. And it's also an internal issue as well. So for peace building groups, not only to understand how the conflict they may be addressing has these structural roots mm -hmm. and requires more than peace building tools, but also understanding internally that there is power and privilege and structural uh, or systems, uh, uh, systemic uh, forces within their groups. Uh, and that uh, 
to address those. Um, oftentimes it takes an awareness of those systems and structures and, and, a, and a willingness to change those and not just having a conversation. Mm. Yeah, it's really interesting um, within the, well, we definitely, that this, what the, the, the dynamic that you're talking about here feels really familiar to uh, the transition movement, um, to, you know, dynamics that I've witnessed and been part of. Um, here within the transition movement, we tend to talk about the inner and the outer. So the kind of inner, inner transition and outer transition, um, rather than sort of peace building and, and um, sort of direct action. But, but it's, it's very much the same dynamic. Um, and it's actually something that, well, I think we're kind of inching our way to finding uh, a way of working, um, of integrating more of each into each. Yeah, maybe more than inching our way. Um, but it's been, it's been quite, it's been quite difficult. Um, and there's been a lot of resistance, I think, on both sides. And I wonder whether that's your experience too, is that, is that people don't, um, yeah, the, the, each, the blind spots of each are actually pretty uncomfortable for, you know, to have the, the, the glasses off or whatever it is that, that, that means that you have to look at the bits where you just haven't been getting it. Um, I mean, do you, do you find that a lot in the groups that you work with, that, that there's resistance there? Yeah, you know, um, I've, been, I've been holding a, quite a tremendous grief uh, over the last two years um, in working with a variety of groups and seeing um, how vulnerable and fragile they are. Mm. So I'm not even talking about what I would see as natural allies in the cause. Mm. We might one that might have more a greater affinity towards a peace building approach, the other towards a social justice approach. Mm. I'm I'm saying even within each one of those, um, I have seen organizations with people who are very passionate uh, and hold very strong views about uh, a, a vision, um, you know, fail within their own groups mm. to realize that same, that same vision. Mm. Um, and I also have a, a great deal of um, tenderness for the situation that people who find themselves in a movement, in an organization, that for the first time makes explicit a vision, a shared purpose to be different, to see a different world, and what kind of expectations that creates <laughs> that are hard to live up to. You know? It's a bit like when you're in very hierarchical, very authoritative, uh, very non-deliberative structures, um, you will stifle yourself and keep it in. And maybe only for so long, but you've certainly been trained how to do that. And all of a sudden you come into a group that has a vision for liberating the world, a vision for creating a new culture, however it sees its vision. And um, and then even the smallest um, pricks like, can become huge issues. Yeah. And you end up, end up swallowing the whole group. Yeah. You know? So in some, play, in some ways, I think the more liberatory, the more visionary a group or an organization is, like the transition movement, the more vulnerable they are to falling into their own uh, internal inconsistencies. Yeah. You know, so part of what I would advise is an incredible amount of just humility and acceptance um, and patience uh, 
when you find yourself in a room full of people who all believe very strongly in something new and something different and something exciting, just be prepared that um, every slight, every experience of harm is going to, is going to, may mean so much more, mm. maybe so much more significant, so much more of a failure, maybe so much more a crush to your dreams, maybe so much more an attack of your basic core self, your values, your sense of worth, um, than if it happened in the world where we're used to that and we don't have greater expectations. Um, and if there's a way that a group can hold that together, like recognize that we are going to go through this, mm -hmm. right? That this is a part, this is a dynamic that we're a part of. And that that is a sign of, not of our dysfunction, not of our failure, but rather that is a sign of how radically we want to live something different. Mm -hmm. The greater the heat and the intensity of the internal work, um, may just signify that there is just so much at stake, so much beautiful that's shared. And so to find a common ground, a place to sit back and say like, look at each other and, and rise above that moment to see like, yes, we're part of this dynamic. And it actually gives us a greater a bond, a joy, a, a togetherness. Yeah, the, yes, <laughs> it's it's salutary words, isn't it? And I and I have seen it so often. And I think you're you're absolutely spot on that there. It's it's a it's the stakes are so high that people care so much about what it is that they're doing that that it can often just end up with a headlong tumble into something which elsewhere would be manageable. And in that in that context just becomes <laughs> becomes completely unmanageable. Someone I was speaking to before was talking about you know, being part of a process to set up a, an intentional community and um, and they just got to the point where, where where they couldn't. They just couldn't. It was there was too much water under the bridge, too much trust had been lost. And actually the you know the community still happened but those guys didn't go with it and it's you know, so, so uh, yeah, just hard, really hard. Um, and so, so just to finish off, I guess, because I think our, our time is our time is probably probably way more than up. But it's been so interesting. What are the what are the kind of you know other than NVC? What are the kind of tools that you point people towards to help with all that? you know, all that kind of pain and, and soul searching and angst that's going to happen. Where are the places that you see that are kind of like rocks in that fast flowing river? Uh, I'm going to give you a meta tool, um, mm -hmm. uh, which I've, I've come to, um, like I've come to really appreciate through my involvement with a, uh, community called the Nonviolent Global Liberation. Mm. Uh, it's a group of folks that are fairly globally situated um, that are thinking about what does it actually, what it, does it actually take to, to live a new a world where everyone's needs matter uh, as, a, as a matter of systems. Like what, what do we need to do to create the structures mm. for that to be possible? given the constraints and the crises that the current world faces. Um, and um, one of the, the core practices within this framework is to look at your organization, to look at your group, and to figure out um, when it comes to different functions of the group, such as decision-making, mm -hmm. such as uh, resource flow, or information flow, feedback loops, or conflict engagement. Um, these are functions that every organization has to be an organization, yeah. um, to work towards some kind of shared purpose. But they are functions that are not necessarily always explicit. Um, 
explicitly carried out through shared agreements. Oftentimes, we operate by implicit ways of working together to share information, make decisions, like give feedback um, that we've inherited from the dominant, uh, from our dominant um, lives, uh, from our own socialization. Um, and we risk by adopting those ways of making decisions, for example, along the dominant paradigm, we risk that um, we just uh, reproduce all of the problems that come with dominant decision-making modes. Problems around power, privilege, um, problems around uh, uh, like uh, non-deliberation, uh, problems around the sort of confirmation bias that happens, uh, not listening to the uh, dissenting voice, uh, group think dynamics and so forth. So one of the things is for any organization is to look at these functions and to spend some really serious time um, dissecting what is actually implicit, what are implicit agreements about how decisions are made or how resources are shared. And then asking, are those in line with the values and the vision of our organization? And if they're not, then coming to explicit agreements about how to align, align them. And it might be that in doing so, you recognize, well, one of the things we implicitly do is very much driven by our lack of capacity, right? So feedback is a common one. Feedback takes a particular form in most of the contexts I've seen that, is not, that doesn't actually capture the power of feedback. Mm. Um, and then often it's because uh, there's little process and capacity to, do, to have feedback be more useful, more valuable. Mm. Well, there are, there are models, there's nonviolent communication, other models that provide some process and, and capacity or skills uh, for doing feedback. And so an explicit agreement might be, we're going to, uh, you know, we're going to look at nonviolent communication, seek whatever training, uh, that we need in that. Uh, we're going to look at sociocracy or holacracy to look around at decision making processes and skills that might be necessary. So, you know, so in instead of giving you uh, a particular list of frameworks to go in, it's that sort of meta idea of first of all figuring out what is it that you want to explicitly fill the gap with uh, an agreement um, in order to, to be more functioning. Uh, as an organization. Yeah. yeah, and then look around. I mean, the world is filled with incredible tools. That's one of the things I think about these times is that we have access to so much wisdom yeah. um, from, from, from indigenous traditions to, the, to religious communities um, and, and beyond. Mm. And uh, yeah, uh, oftentimes it's figuring out who what do we actually need and why do we need it? Mm -hmm. and creating a, a sense of commitment of, of determination and motivation to, to adopt, to adopt something. Yeah, it feels absolutely accurate what you're saying. And it's interesting how it, it kind of echoes um, kind of individual process as well of, you know, making the things that we just assume about ourselves and our lives. It, you know, bringing those to consciousness and then being able to make decisions about them, you know, is part of growing up and maturing and, you know, be able to cope with life a bit better. That bringing, bringing to consciousness um, the stuff that's unconscious, that we just think is part of life, but actually it's not. It's, it's upbringing or, or social, socialization, or, you know, all that stuff. Um, yeah, the, the kind of... Um, the blessing of consciousness when we can, when we can get there. <laughs> Listen, we should finish. Yeah. It's been an absolute delight speaking to you. Thank you so much for, for your time and wisdom. Uh, really, really appreciate it. Uh, and it's lovely to meet you. Likewise. Really my pleasure. I'm honored. Mm -hmm.